this morning, we're going into our last part. We're concluding this series of the Psalmist Playlist, and we just want to celebrate with people, whether they're in person this morning here at the auditorium in the church here, or they're watching online. I pray that God will make His home in your heart this morning. And as we conclude our sermon series, my hope is as we have unpacked throughout this month of October that, you know, maybe we didn't cover your favorite scripture as yet, or maybe there's some, because believe me, there's 150 Psalms, so I told you we're never going to be able to cover all 150. But my prayer and my hope is that there was in the Psalms that we've unpacked that there were some nuggets, some truths, some deeper meaning on some of those Psalms that we've unpacked. And um, I chatted to Roxanne, you know, earlier this week, and I said maybe the idea I have is to maybe next year is to actually unpack Psalms a little bit more for us. And then we can go a little bit longer with the book of Psalms. But this morning, we're going to be going into another Psalm. But before we do, let us just pray as we prepare our hearts for the Word of God. Heavenly Father and Almighty God and King, we come before you and we thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy, Lord, that is new every day. And I pray, Lord God, that you would just continue to unpack us, that you would just reveal more and more of yourself in your word. Lord, we pray, Lord, that as we go into this word, that it will cut through the marrow and the bone. And as always, Lord, that your servant will decrease and you will increase. We ask all this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So, concluding with this series, I chose this one, and I wanted to leave this one for last, because I really, really like this particular psalm. And so, we're going to be covering not the whole psalm, but just taking out some of the verses out of this psalm, to make it a little bit more in line of where I want to go this morning with this. But it's found in Psalm 118. So if you've got your Bibles here, you can turn to Psalm 118, 118. And it should be also on the screen, but if you have your Bibles, you can turn there also. Normally, if you are new to the whole Christian walk, you can just help you out with this. Psalms is normally in the middle, more or less the middle of the Bible, more or less, so... Just work it out there. Um, You might have different translations, but we're working through the NIV this morning, particularly to these introduction scriptures. If you got it, just say amen. Okay, let's go for it. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say, His love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, His love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, His love endures forever. When hard pressed, I cried to the Lord. He brought me into a spacious place. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? And verse 7 carries on to say, The Lord is with me. He is my helper. I look triumphant on my enemies. And then we fast track to verse 28 and 29, which says, You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will extol you. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love is endures forever. Yo, I love that psalm. Psalm 118 is a type of psalm that is known as an anti-funan psalm, which is, means it echoes whereby God's people echoes two different groups of people, echoes the psalm in different places. Now, you might not realize this, but you actually did this earlier on in the service. Remember when Roxanne came up and she said one verse, and then what did you do? You repeated a different part of that verse. So you were actually doing something which is part of the Psalm 118 as well. Now, this particular psalm is one of six psalms also as the, what they call the Egyptian praises. 
Psalms that were written to remind the people of God of his blessings of releasing them from slavery in Egypt. Now, these six Psalms from Psalm 113 and in this particular Psalm, Psalm 118, are meant to be read within your families. And in the early times, it was meant to be read in families when they were doing worship services, especially, I want you to get this, especially during Passover. So Psalm 118 was actually read out to family members. As you were gathered together, having a feast, doing Passover, that they were actually reading this out. Now, there's a reason I utilize this. There's a reason I say this is if you understand Passover from the New Testament, you will have this picture of Jesus and his apostles in the upper room on the night before he was crucified, that he would actually be also reading this. Now, let's just go there for a moment. Imagine the Psalm 118. Imagine the Son of God knowing that he's about what is about to unfold and what he's about to endure. And yet, he is singing in the upper room. His steadfast love endures forever. Yo. Hey? The Son of God, Jesus, knowing that he is about to get crucified, and yet he is singing. The steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. Now, the promise. This promise of his steadfast love in Jewish forever is repeated five times in this particular psalm. Four in the beginning and then towards the end of this psalm. Now, let me just say this. Be glad that Roxanne and I, I did actually just ask her not to do it because Psalm 136, it's got, a, it's got 26 his love in Jewish forever. Yo, we would have still be stuck here. His love endures forever. Okay, where are we now? Verse 5. His love endures forever. I'm only asking five times. But here's the thing. We talk about it and they're like, oh, why are we repeating this? This is like repetitive. Why do we have to repeat his love endures forever? And this is my first point I want to make. There's power of repetition. There's power in repetition. Repetition is a powerful tool in shaping what we know and what we believe in. We sometimes say things repeatedly because we want to let it stick in our minds for people's safety, for our own children. Okay, parents out there, you always repeat something to your children. And then what we do when we repeat it, we say, repeat after me. We say, we say things like, Little Johnny, don't forget your tuck shop money. Repeat after me. What did, I, what did mommy just say? And then, little Johnny, remember this number. Because we gave them our, our cell phone number so they can remember. That's our emergency number. Repeat after mommy. What is the number? And I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm just the weird one because I remember my mom used to tell us also, don't talk to strangers. Repeat after me. Don't talk to strangers. And then she had this other thing to say, put on clean underwear. Repeat after me. <laughs> put on clean underwear. Because you might never know, but you might get into an accident. Whatever that means. I don't know. Maybe she was worried that I might get knocked or something, and then they take me to the emergency ward and have to cut my pants. Like, whoo, look at that. I don't know, my mom was weird. <laughs> but we also ask our children to remember things in repetition by saying to them, we're speaking words over them repetitively. We say, you are precious. You're a warrior. You're a princess. You're a winner. Jesus loves you. Remember, remember. Because here's the thing. The days will come when the fish don't bite and the sun don't shine and the jobs don't come and the relationships get undone. And health crumbles and when life gives you lemons and love seems lost, we live in a world, let me just say this, where people will hurt us sometimes. 
in ways that have negative effects on our lives. Sometimes just for a mere period, but sometimes for life. But this is the power of repetition pertaining to this psalm exactly. The truth revealed about who God is. The steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. And here's the key. We are not supposed to forget this. That's why it's repeated so many times to remind us that whatever you are facing, the steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. Whatever might come, whatever might come my way, I know that the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. You know that song? Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Yes. Some of you are like, you, you, you get, it, you get the, the part right, the first part. Great is thy faithfulness. And then we get into the middle part of that song and like, and then you look at your name. And, like, and then you get to the uncle. Great is thy faithfulness. Can I tell you that's fine? I want to say this. Because as long as you just get to part, great is thy faithfulness. See, 2 Peter 1, verse 12 to 15, and I'm reading from the Passion Translation, says the following in regards to repetition. I won't hesitate to continue to remind you of these truths, even though you are aware of them and are well established in the present measure of truth you have already embraced. And as long as I live, I will continue to awaken you with this reminder. Since our Lord Jesus, the Anointed One, has clearly revealed that my departure is near, indeed, I'm passionate to share these things with you, so that you will always remember them after my exodus from this life. This is Apostle Peter saying that even when you have got this truth, maybe something has shaken you, maybe things have literally, it hasn't gone your way, and you've like forgotten about the truth of who God is in your life. And this is Apostle Peter speaking life into that congregation, into the people there that might have forgotten the love of God. And he's saying, I will continually tell you how good God is, how much He loves you. And let me just say, fast track now a few thousand years, I will continually tell you also how much God loves you, how much He cares for you. Yes, you might go through storms. Yes, you might have a bit of a hiccup, a speed bump. But guess what? God still loves you because the promise is steadfast love endures forever. You know what is the Hebrew translation for forever? Forever. No, I'm just messing with you, but this is the truth. You don't have to go through seven years of theology to understand what the word forever means. Forever means never ending. It, it carries on. So when God says, and that is what God says, my steadfast love for you will never, ever end. It will never run dry. Yo, okay, let's go now. Modern translation. Analogy 101. Water might run dry. Run, run, Dry run here in, in Toti, but who had promise of the water supply? Yo, I must come to you guys. 
Because we had no water this week. Yeah, just put your hand up if you could always, every, every, every day you have water. Roxanne, just take a photo. Just we can. <laughs> Kathy, just check on the membership list. <laughs> All jokes aside, but when they have struggles, when we have a supply run dry, that's natural. But here's the crazy thing about our living, our being. We serve a supernatural God. And His supply will never run dry. His love will never end. That's why the scripture says the very basic essence of who God is. God is love. That's why He cannot stop loving you. There's nothing, and I want to say this. There's nothing that can stop God from loving you. Can I tell you, you can even run away. He will still love you. You can even mess up so much that you think that you cannot love God. That's fine. Can I tell you, God will still love you. You don't have to go far to understand this because you just have to think about the prodigal son. He messed up. Did everything wrong that can possibly can go wrong. And yet, when time came for him to come to the realization that he needs to go back home, the father didn't go, ooh, no, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. You need to first sort your life out, do about 20 Hail Marys, and then come back. God is not that God. He doesn't operate that way. He waits. And get this part. If you understand the story of the prodigal son, he chases after you before you even have to go forward. Because that's the love of God. That he loves you so much. That nothing, and I say nothing, can separate you from the love of God. I have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow or the next day or the next day. None of us do, but we know this. No matter what happens tomorrow or the next day or the next day, He will love us with steadfast love that will never, ever end. Now, that's not just a takeaway. It's the regular way that this psalm was intended to be used. To plant something in our memory. Remember, repetition. After all, this psalm is collected from a time of Israel's hardest times that they lived. When they were in exile. When they had been taken into bondage and slavery. And then they went again into bondage. Because remember, they were exiting out of Egypt. But they then were brought into Babylon again. And yet this psalm still remains to say the steadfast love of the Lord remains forever. Because even during the time that they were in Babylon, they were singing this psalm. So the psalmist now writes a worship song for the people to repeat and to say to one another. Not just one time, but for a thousand years in Jewish households. The steadfast love of the Lord endures Forever. That's unquestionably the takeaway that is meant to happen. The next takeaway we need to take from Psalm 118 is found in verse 6. And I'm reading from the ESV version. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? And so the first point there to take in is the Lord is on my side. But I want to be all honest here. As believers, this phrase has been hijacked more than once. This, this phrase, the Lord is on my side, people have used it either for aggression or for selfish gain. They've adopted this phrase as indemnity form, meaning I can do whatever I want. I can say whatever I want to whatever people I want because the Lord is on my side. And so we use that phrase to tell people off. Because how dare they behave that way? The Lord is on my side. How dare I carry on with that sin? The Lord is on my side. 
Now, let me just explain this because I think we, we have to understand because sometimes we take things out of context and we try to fit it into our life. And we do it so good as Christians. We do it so well in our lifestyle to try and take Scripture to fit into our lifestyle instead of us fitting into the lifestyle of what we are supposed to be as Christians. Because this verse is not what's supposed to be like as made for aggression or to have indemnity on us. But the truth of this verse actually means is that verse is in essence the covenant promise of God. He have walked away from me. You have sinned against me. You have rebelled against me. And I'm still on your side. You walked away. I haven't walked away. I'm still for you. I'm still on your side. The psalmist is driving this deep into people's hearts and lives. The very attributes of who God is. That he is on your side. To a, to a non-believer, to a non-believer, this might be looking like overbearing. To say that God is on your side every moment, every second of your life, God is there. It might feel overbearing, but as a believer, let me just say what that is actually called. It's called saving grace. Then there's this incredible word in verse 7 that we might miss if we don't look carefully at this. And that word is called helper. In verse 7, the Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. Now, do you remember where you first encountered that word in the Bible? We're going a little bit Bible school now. The first time that word was ever used was in the first book of the Bible. When God created Adam, he's like, it's not good for man to be alone. I need to do something about it. I need to get him a helper. And then out of this came Eve. Genesis 2.18, just to make sure you know the truth. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. You see, God provides for Adam a helper who is fit, suited, just right for him. Because it was not good that he be alone. So God said, I will bring this helper to you. One who in intimacy and affection and support will actually give you the help you need. What God has called you to be. And now God gives himself that same name. I will help you. I will be your helper. When everything surrounds you, when everything is dark, when everything seems bad, the persecution comes and they are punishing you hard, but I am your helper. As close as a spouse, as deep in love, as affectionate as that can be, Supportive as I can, I am your helper. And again, we come to the idea and understanding about saving grace. You have turned from me. You walked away from me. The enemy is surrounding, but I'm here to be your helper. And we need those words. Let me just say this. We need those words in the real world. We need to know that when everything goes dark, when everything feels like the enemy is just coming in, coming in, surrounding us, and it feels like we have no place to move, we need those words to say that God is on my side, that He is my helper. The band can start making their way to the stage because we need His help. We cannot face this world without His help. We need God to be by our side. There's things in our life that we cannot deal with on our own strength and our own ability. We need God to help us through these situations, to encourage us, to lift us up, to build us up, to strengthen us in the times of weakness. We need God. I don't know about you, but I need God every day of my life. And to it's those words in this Psalm 118 that just brings me new life. It gives me confidence to face whatever may come its way. 
Because if I know that God is on my side, nothing has to cause me anxiety and stress. I don't have to fear anything because I know God is with me. And he is my helper. He carries me. He strengthens me. And maybe this morning you feel a little bit depleted and defeated. Maybe you feel a little bit not yourself. Maybe things have happened. Maybe it caused a little bit of a, a shocker in your life. Maybe things have not gone the way that you've planned for 2024. You know, really people are talking about 2025, and you're like, I'm just trying to survive in 2024. I'm just trying to catch my breath. People are in thriving mode, and I'm still in survival mode. But can I tell you something? Those people that are thriving, I can't speak of individual people, but I can speak for myself. I'm doing it because I know who is my helper. I'm doing this because I know God is on my side. You might might feel lonely. Let me just tell you that's exactly what the enemy wants you to feel. He wants you to feel lonely. He wants you to feel isolated. Because it's in those moments that he can speak lies into your mind. But when you know that God is on your side, you don't have to listen to the voice of the enemy because he is the father of lies. He will never tell you the truth. Just as much as God cannot stop loving you, the devil cannot stop by telling you truths. He will always just keep on telling you lies. He will just continue to tell you lie after lie after lie. But if you know that God is on your side, you know what is the difference between a lie and a truth. Because you know when God is on your side, as much as that voice from the enemy might tell you something, You will listen to the voice of God that says, my son, my daughter, don't listen to that. Listen to what I'm speaking to you. And the scripture speaks that very clearly. If you are in close proximity to the father and you are in that regular space, like like a spouse is to a spouse, when you know who your spouse's voice is, because I can tell you this, when Oksane phones me, I don't have to look what the number is. I know because I know her voice. Because I spend enough time with her. If you spend enough time with God, you know His voice. You know when He speaks life into you. And sometimes the reason we repeat, sometimes the reason you respond with such volume and dearness when we sing holy, 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 is something deep in you has been touched. Something has been stirred within you. Verse 27 brings the whole picture of grace to every believer. The Lord is good and He's made His light to shine upon us. Now read these words as part of verse 27. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. See, here's the crazy part. The Jews were thinking of all those lambs, all those sacrificial animals that they have to do. But we read it now in the voice of the Savior, who would have to read it himself on that night. Remember, he had to read 118 during the time of his last supper. And he had to read these words. And knowing what's about to happen, He had to echo this in the upper room, but for himself to think what this means. Bind the sacrifice to the place on the altar where I will provide for the sins of the people. Bind me to the altar, and then once we know it, verse 28 and 29 brings the Psalm 118 to a close. This is Jesus singing this in the upper room. Get this. Receive this. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, and I will extol you. I give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. When we perceive the wonder and the greatness and the goodness of this very picture, it somehow lifts us beyond the earthly matter. 
beyond the earthly pain, beyond the tears. We are lifted to give thanks to the Lord whose steadfast love endures forever. It's the very intent of the repetition of the psalm to take our hearts there to the throne room of the Father. Because if Jesus can sing 118 on the last day when he was supposed to be crucified, how much more can we give thanks to the Father knowing how good he is? And I want you to be encouraged. I want you to know that the steadfast love for you, put your name in there, will never end. You might have messed up. Let me just say this. We all mess up. Yes, even Pastor Kali messes up. But we have the truth. And I love this truth because that's a very epiphany of grace. That even when I mess up, God still loves me. And he will never, ever stop loving me. And so I want you to stand this morning. We're going to close with a worship song, but I want you to worship with me. It talks about the love that endures forever and ever. And so this morning, lift your voice. Let the truth of his love that endures forever resonate in your heart and your mind. Are you ready to worship? Yo. Are you ready to worship? Let's lift our voices. Go for it, worship team.